Well, thank you, Ben, and thanks so much to the Linda Hall Library for allowing me to spend time working in your excellent collections and the chance to talk about some of my research here today. Let me start by saying I'm going to try not to go into labor while I'm giving this talk <laughs> or fall over. <laughs> ben assures me that he is not that kind of doctor. <laughs> <laughs> even though we have our PhDs, and reminded me that this is a science and technology library, not a medical library. So, no help there. <laughs> so, I attended UMKC as an undergraduate, as Ben mentioned, and so the opportunity to hold a fellowship at the Linda Hall Library has felt like a wonderful homecoming, especially after being away from Kansas City for so many years. I grew up um, about an hour north of here in rural Missouri. My childhood was spent immersed in a world of plants, both cultivated and wild. And as a result, my thoughts really sit firmly um, at the intersection of nature and agriculture and the history of science. I, I really find plants truly fascinating, and I hope some of you will too by the end of this talk. Um, but perhaps even more interesting are some of the human stories uh, that come with them. So the project that you're going to hear about today uh, contains a series of narratives populated by compelling characters who worked to fill the United States with interesting and life-changing plants. Now, these are stories that are unfamiliar to most people, but I'm convinced that they are worth telling. Uh, they're national and international stories, certainly, but they're also Midwestern stories. Um, Paul and Wilson Papineau, two brother plant explorers from Topeka. Howard Dorsett, another explorer and an alum of the University of Missouri. And... David Fairchild, who grew up and studied at K-State in Manhattan, are only a few. Uh, some of the plants, too, of course, came to transform Midwestern landscapes and the foods that we eat. So I'd like to start by introducing you to a young scientist who stumbles into the world of plant exploration. When our story begins, little does he know that in a few years' time, uh, he will be at the center of a network of federally funded explorer scientists who are gradually transforming the nation's foods uh, and our farms. So in November of 1893, a young David Fairchild set off on a voyage across the Atlantic. Aboard his ship, the Fulda, the 24-year-old scientist was leaving behind his parents, his friends, and a very promising career as a young scientist for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Now, earlier that year, Fairchild had applied for and won funding from the Smithsonian to go and work for a stint at the zoological station in Naples in southern Italy. Now, growing up in Kansas, in a time when foreign travel was still pretty rare for most people, uh, David jumped at the opportunity to go abroad. As he sailed across the Atlantic, storms tossed uh, his ship violently. It blew the ship off course, blasting the decks, smashing dishes, destroying cargo. Eventually, the storm subsided, and... So passengers were able to leave their cabins. And that evening, he met a man who would change the course of Fairchild's life and his career, as well as steer the botanical future of the United States. Barbara Lathrop, seated here, uh, was intimidating. A wealthy, distinguished, older bachelor with no fixed address except San Francisco's very exotic Bohemian Club, Lathrop's primary occupation was being rich and <laughs> traveling the world, which sounds wonderful. Uh, he circumnavigated the globe more times than he could recall. 
uh, staying in the finest hotels, and delighting fellow Western travelers with stories of his adventures. Now, where Lathrop was very worldly and cosmopolitan, Fairchild appeared shy and provincial. Fairchild eventually worked up the nerve to ask Lathrop about what it was like to visit the exotic island of Java, a place that he had long wanted to visit. And afterward, he, he wrote, I thought him the wittiest man I had ever heard. So the, their encounter on board was brief, but memorable for both, both men. About a month later, after Fairchild had spent many long days uh, at the zoological station in Naples, poring over a microscope, uh, studying of all things, cell division in seaweed, which I'm sure is fascinating <laughs> for somebody, uh, Lathrop shows up one day and he pays him this, this unexpected visit. He comes bursting into the lab smoking a cigar. He doesn't ask if I could, he could smoke in there, but he was. Um, and he said, I've decided to give you $1,000 to fund your trip to Java for scientific exploration of some kind, an investment in science, he called it. <laughs> Uh, that's, to put that in context, that's about $28,000 today. So not bad for uh, a brief acquaintance on board his ship. So he had already left his job at the USDA for this stint in Italy, and now Lathrop was proposing that Fairchild, again, abandon his work for a new adventure. After more than a little hesitation, Fairchild eventually discontinued his laboratory studies and decided to set off for Java, where Lathrop eventually joined him. The two men set out together on an odyssey that would last four years, traveling the world, forging a friendship that would endure the rest of their lives. So at the journey's end in 1897, Fairchild found himself returning again to American soil, once again in search of work of some kind in federal science. Now, his arrival in Washington, D.C. Uh, came at an opportune time. Although the federal government had dabbled with this idea of plant introduction for decades, their efforts were really sporadic and decentralized. There was still a lot of work to do. So he shows up, asks for his job back at the USDA, and this is our young Fairchild here with his friend, Walter Swingle, who he grew up with in Kansas. They're buddies. They go to the Secretary of Agriculture, and they pitch the idea of this Office of Foreign Seed and Plant Introduction. The idea is Fairchild would be at its head, and then the office would employ the so-called agricultural explorers, scientists, to then go around the world and look for interesting plants that they would bring back to the United States. Uh, I think much to Fairchild and Swingle's surprise, uh, the Secretary of Agriculture says, OK. And a few months later, Congress decides to uh, approve funding for what became the Office of Foreign Seed and Plant introduction. So let's take a step back here for just a minute. Why do we care about any of this? I want to tip my hand fairly early here and tell you why I think this topic matters for everybody. First, by 1932, agricultural explorers estimated that about 95 percent of the crops grown in the United States were the result of some kind of plant introduction, uh, both in including federal efforts or private importations. I think most of us go about our days not really giving too much thought to the foods that we eat. When we do think about food, we're usually more concerned with calories or nutrients, but we don't often consider or know about 
uh, the stories behind the fruits and vegetables and grains that populate our landscape and fill our diet. So with this project, I, I hope to change that and share some of the stories behind those things that are so familiar to us. If I spoke this afternoon about all of the plant explorers and important contributions na to national agriculture, I would have you here uh, until after dark. And I don't think anyone is committed to that. <laughs> so I've just decided to share a few of my favorite stories today. A second consideration of this project has to do with questions of agricultural biodiversity. So during its heyday, the Office of Foreign Seed and Plant Introduction shipped tens of thousands of plants back to the United States. While many of the species didn't turn out to be popular enough for a commercial industry, a few important species stuck. But over time, the genetic diversity of those varieties has become strikingly narrow, often reducing hundreds of varieties of a plant species to a, only a handful, or in some cases, a single commercial cultivar. One of the central ironies that I've discovered in studying plant introduction is that although plant explorers brought back unprecedented genetic variety to the United States, in the hands of plant breeders and industrialists and other scientific experts, American agriculture has become more genetically uniform than ever. And it begs the question, you know, how did this happen? Why is that the case? So before we attempt to answer those questions, I'd like to go ahead and introduce to you my cast of characters. You've already met David Fairchild. This is Frank Meyer. He is a Dutch immigrant who comes to the United States as a young man and explores in China. This is Paul and Wilson Popeno. They are two ambitious brothers uh, from Topeka. And this is Howard Dorset. He's a longtime friend of David Fairchild and a plant explorer best known for his work with soybeans. So I'd like to pick up our narrative a few years after Fairchild's return to Washington, D.C. He's back in D.C., he's sitting in an office, he doesn't really want to be there, <laughs> he'd rather be out in the field, and he is struggling as a young man to handle the immense administrative responsibilities of this new office that he's helped create, and at the same time recruit talented explorers who can go and carry out expeditions in his place. So by 1904, Fairchild was on the lookout for a new plant explorer, someone he could send to China, a place that had long interested Westerners. He knew that to be a successful plant explorer, you had to be curious and intelligent, diligent, adaptable, willing to work long hours for very little money, and suffer the many discomforts of turn-of-the-century foreign travel. Uh, but in a massive country with very few rural roads and even fewer American-style comforts, Fairchild knew that he would need just the right sort of man for the job. So he asks his contacts at some of the agricultural research stations, and they don't have anybody for him. Um, finally, one of his staff approaches him and says, I know a guy, but... He's kind of strange. <laughs> okay. This is David Fairchild after a few years sitting behind a desk. <laughs> and this is our young Frank Meyer with a fantastic beard. Okay. Uh, perhaps Frank Meyer did seem a bit odd. A Dutch immigrant arriving in America only a few years earlier, at the age of 25, he was young and restless and obsessed with plants. He had held odd jobs working in botanical gardens for the USDA, the Missouri Botanical Society in St. Louis, a research station in California, among others, but he had never 
managed to stay in one place for a few months at a time. He felt confined by any indoor work uh, that was put in front of him or um, you know, being unable to take off on spontaneous trips whenever the mood suited him. He really liked to walk. Um, he was constantly scruffy, covered in dirt and sweat from walking and digging in the dirt, looking at plants. He reeked of body odor, apparently, and often avoided eye contact. One author described his knowledge of plants as savant-like. Now, despite his unwillingness to stay rooted in one place, uh, which sounds like some of my fellow millennials liking moving around a lot. <laughs> um, past employers and teachers attested to his quick and eager mind and his hardworking nature. And Fairchild admitted after their interview here, from the first time I set eyes on him, I believed him. And Meyer, he decided, was the right man for the job. So with a very modest salary of about... A thousand or twelve hundred dollars a year. Meyer had hardly struck it rich, but he was eager to explore China uh, on behalf of his adopted country. So in August of 1905, he travels to San Francisco where he boards a ship called the Coptic and sets sail for Peking. Now, Meyer was a meticulous collector by all accounts. He covered an average of about 30 miles a day on foot. And remember, this is um, in a place and time where there are few roads. Uh, he sent back thousands of plants and seeds and cuttings, uh, either by mail or by ship, including varieties of persimmon and ginkgo biloba, pears, apricots, walnuts, peaches, white cabbages, red turnips, lemons, barleys, cherries, numerous ornamental plants. Um, I could go on. In total, he sent back 2,500 distinct introductions to the Department of Agriculture over the course of four different missions between 1905 and 1918. Now, this was, of course, no small task. In addition to finding the plants, which were, of course, in obscure, isolated places with no roads, um, and communicating with locals through a translator, the cuttings and seeds that he found had to be shipped in damp moss, boxed or wrapped up, and then mailed or shipped at ports. Now, unfortunately, not everyone loved the work of Fairchild and his office. Now, while Meyer was exploring abroad, trouble is really starting to brew back at home. His shipments coincided with a rise in fears about the ecological impact of foreign plants. Not only concerns that some of those plants would become invasive species, but also that foreign plants were likely to harbor pests and diseases that would infiltrate and contaminate the United States. Of course, there's an element of practicality here. But some of these voices were also motivated by a growing nativist sentiment, a sort of fear and dislike of foreigners at the time that included both people and plants. Soon after, Congress and many states uh, began passing quarantine laws restricting the importation of foreign plants into the United States. Now, these actions were mostly in response to the promptings of one man, Charles Marlitt, who interestingly enough was the best man at David Fairchild's wedding, but that's because his best friend was out of the country at the time. So they, they, they have a very complicated relationship, but at the end of the day, he doesn't really like him. Um, <laughs> He's very vocal, and he is a prolific federal entomologist who really disliked uh, Fairchild and the work of his plant explorers. He becomes the head of the new 
Federal Horticultural Board, which is a regulatory commission that was tasked with overseeing new quarantines and inspections. You can see the inspectors here going through a shipment. Um, Marlet forced all of Meyer's plants to undergo a rigorous inspection and fumigation process once they arrived back in the United States that often killed plants in the process. So Meyer understandably reacted with considerable frustration to these new regulations. While he and Fairchild and others were working to expand the variety of plants in the United States, men like Marlet were trying to slow importations and limit the range of new biodiversity. Now, despite regulatory challenges back home, Meyer continued to successfully ship new plants to the United States. There were just more hurdles in doing so. On the outside, things are going reasonably well for Meyer. But how is he really doing? Fairchild's office and countless growers and experimenters continued to benefit from his shipments. But plant exploration, if you take any time to look at his personal papers, you'll see that that work took a substantial toll on Frank Meyer. The combination of Heat and humidity, insects and unsanitary conditions caused recurring health problems. In northern regions, he nearly froze to death from camping out and sleeping in unheated hotels. Uh, besides the physical effects of travel in harsh regions, his letters over the course of several years reveal seasons of deep loneliness, sleeplessness, and depression. In one letter, he admitted, he said, I feel the evening of life slowly descending upon me, and the fearful sorrow that hangs over the earth does not make life the same as it used to be. The loneliness and responsibilities therefore seem to me to become heavier and heavier, and sometime, not too far distant, I'll lay down this heavy cloak. Now that's quite something to get in the mail. Um, Fairchild received, you know, these letters, and he attempts to encourage him, writing back. But I think he probably underestimated the severity of his condition, and he probably suffered from depression, and that went undiagnosed. On May 31st, 1918, Meyer boarded a steamer for a trip down the Yangtze River to Shanghai. He ate dinner, left his cabin around 11.20 p.m., and before midnight, the cabin boy on duty reported that he couldn't find him. After an extensive search, his body was eventually recovered. Locals determined that it was death by drowning, but it's impossible to say whether that was by accident, somehow falling overboard, or suicide. Now, Meyer's death dealt a heavy blow to both Fairchild and the rest of the Office of Foreign Seed and Plant Introduction. But perhaps as Meyer would have liked, his personal legacy was soon overshadowed by the many plants that he helped introduce. So there were 2,500, but some of his most significant introductions included the Siberian elm, which provided shade trees and windbreaks used during times of drought for windswept and arid plains, although in some places that's now considered an invasive. Genetic material from a wild pear variety that has resulted in the Bradford pear that we enjoy today. Uh, he provided lots of insect and disease-resistant wild fruit varieties that became rootstock for commercial plants. The Meyer lemon, which may be familiar to some of you, um, it's become increasingly trendy with foodies in recent years. <laughs> Seeing a few heads nodding. Here's a picture of it. Um, 42 varieties of soybeans, zoysia grass, which many of you have seen and encountered, it's popular for lawns, and a blight-resistant Chinese chestnut tree. 
So about the same time that Meyer was working his way through his third expedition in the wilds of China in 1913, Paul and Wilson Papineau, two American brothers, were hospitalized in the Iraqi city of Basra. Now, Paul Papineau, 23, lay delirious on his cot, twitching with typhoid fever. His brother, Wilson, barely 20, suffered chills, persistent diarrhea, and fever. Malaria, the staff told him. The brothers had little money, few local contacts, and a long way to go before they could return home. Now, only a few months earlier, about half a world away, their father had taken out a loan to finance this year-long expedition through northern Africa and the Middle East so they could collect plants for the family nursery business located in Altadena, California. It was just outside of L.A., north of Pasadena. After recovering their health, the brothers continued their, their journey through Iraq to Oman and Algeria. Leveraging their really meager funds, they ended up collecting thousands of date palm cuttings, which they shipped back home to California. So that's Paul with date palm cuttings. <laughs> Wrapped up, ready to go. And then here's an illustration of a date, which some of you have enjoyed in the hall. So as a part of his work with agricultural improvement, David Fairchild, around this time, became enthusiastic about the new field of genetics. In 1913, just a few months before the Papineau brothers returned from their expedition, he became the president of the American Genetic Association. Now, this preeminent organization brought together high-ranking bureaucrats, leading scientists, and professional breeders with a common mission, promoting genetics and the laws of heredity in order to improve plant, animal, and human racial stocks. Now, while this type of racial science is obviously very problematic for us today, it was considered increasingly mainstream at the time. I think the most interesting thing to note here is that it actively intertwined eugenic ideas about racial purity with agronomy for the purpose of simultaneously shaping both America's farms and human society. So these subjects were all a part of the same conversation, which might seem to us today as a, a bit bizarre. But the implications were that, armed with the knowledge of genetic inheritance, plant breeders working in cooperation with plant explorers could create superior plants for American soil, while eliminating inferior varieties a corollary to racial science that sought to restrict or eliminate inferior humans. So finally, returning from their expedition in the summer of 1913, the Papineau brothers were approached by David Fairchild and recruited for two distinct and pivotal tasks. Now, both brothers had an interest in breeding, Wilson continued his work with plants, and he was appointed a plant explorer for the USDA in Fairchild's office. On his first major expedition, Wilson traveled with two other explorers to Brazil in search of new varieties of navel oranges. Thank you very much, Wilson Papano. Um, after Brazil, he spent several years collecting hundreds of varieties of avocados in Central and South America. Now, that is a whole other adventure that I would love to be able to tell you. So if you want to know more about avocado hunting in Central America, talk to me afterward. Uh, let me show you a couple of pictures. So these are all varieties that you cannot buy in the store today. Um, but were collected and cultivated in Southern California uh, shortly after Wilson Papineau brought them back. This one on the end here is called the Purple Wester, purple avocado. 
Okay. Now, Paul, on the other hand, expanded his interests to incorporate plant and human subjects and was offered the, the job of the editor of the Journal of Heredity, which is the publication of the American Genetic Association, the organization dedicated to improving plants and animals and humans. Paul accepted Fairchild's offer and then relocated to Washington, D.C., where he served as the editor of the journal for the next four years. Now, during this period, Fairchild and the Papineau brothers worked together as a team. Wilson would provide regular shipments of foreign plants, and Paul would popularize the work of plant explorers while also promoting the agenda of genetic improvement broadly. Paul's tenure as editor balanced both eugenic and agricultural interests, emphasizing for readers their overlapping goals. So this is Paul Papineau, eventually known as Dr. Papineau. I think it's interesting to note here, after he leaves his job as editor of the journal, he authored a leading textbook on eugenics, and by the mid-1920s, he began promoting forced sterilization, especially in California. After World War II, when eugenics was less acceptable in academic and popular circles, uh, he shifted his interest to families. He became the nation's first marriage counselor, claiming that the right kinds of marriages would produce the right kinds of offspring and yield a productive and healthy society. Now, Paul always viewed his early interests in plants as foundational to his later work. I think the most interesting aspect of this story to me is how the lives and careers of some of these plant explorers and the other scientists with whom they associated were rarely simple, rarely just about one thing, but they're part of an interconnected network or community of scientific thought, really struggling to make sense of the science of heredity and harness it to the nation's advantage, wherever they are. Nevertheless, New research in the field of heredity and genetics brought about significant change for our plant explorers. By the 1920s, Fairchild was becoming a man out of sync with his time. In the old days, a plant was valuable if it could be brought to the United States and adapted to American soil and produced something that people liked to eat. Pretty simple. Plants were largely regarded as whole organisms. But with advancements in the field of heredity, it became possible to utilize plant material with specific genetic characteristics to modify and create increasingly sophisticated varieties. So for plant explorers, this meant instead of just collecting plants broadly, they were encouraged to be more exclusive in their approach, often looking at plants uh, in search of a single valuable trait, a sort of plants as parts approach. Now this shift radically reduced cultivated diversity and encouraged agricultural leaders to focus their industries around a few select cultivars. So Let's recap a moment. <laughs> I've talked about the mission of the Office of Foreign Seed and Plant Introduction and the vision of its chief explorer, David Fairchild, to radically expand the biodiversity of the United States and promote new agricultural industries. We then looked at the productive and in some ways tragic life of Frank Meyer and saw by looking at our Papineau brothers how the emerging science of heredity transformed the work of plant exploration. So I have one more story for you today that grapples with the issues of biodiversity and agricultural abundance. As commercial cultivars became increasingly precise and as farmers produced higher yields, scientists and industry leaders looked for new and surprising ways to harness agricultural products. <clears throat> 
and made decisions that have transformed our farms and our food today. This is Howard Dorset, one of our plant explorers. Now, Howard Dorset was a man on whom fate had delivered a lot of heavy blows. Uh, after studying at the University of Missouri, he joined the USDA's section of plant pathology, so diagnosing plant diseases, in 1891. After 13 years, Dorset decides to relocate with his family to Northern California to oversee the department's plant introduction garden there. So after new plants were shipped back to Washington, D.C., they were sent out to these uh, introduction gardens all over the country uh, to try to grow them and, and see, how, see how they would do. So he goes out to Northern California to run one of these gardens caring for many of the plants that Meyer himself shipped from China. Uh, but his wife and eldest daughter die suddenly while he's there. And he decides to quit his job um, with the USDA and return to the East Coast and immerse himself in a commercial horticultural business. Uh, two years later, sadly, his youngest daughter dies in the winter of 1909. And in the midst of these personal crises, David Fairchild approaches Dorset and convinces him to come back to the USDA. So in addition to the horticultural experiments and publications that he had done before, Dorset, Dorset decides to expand his work to plant introduction, accompanying a young Wilson Papineau to Brazil in 1913. Um, the mid-1920s then brought a series of trips to China, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, eventually uh, punctuated by the death of his only remaining child, Jim, to tuberculosis in 1927. The only person left in his family at that point is his daughter-in-law, Ruth. So in the wake of all of this loss, um, Dorset had very few commitments outside his career. So he agrees to set off in search of soybeans, a crop that had seen at that time limited plantings in the United States, mostly for cattle forage, but was at the time attracting growing interest from researchers. So he left for Japan in February of 1929, accompanied by a man named William Morse, a soybean specialist from the USDA's Office of Forage Crops. After a year of plant collecting through Japan and Korea, the expedition then traveled to China, where Dorset, at the age of 68, contracts double pneumonia, and Fairchild orders him to stop what he's doing and receive extended medical treatment, while Morris continues to collect soybeans until he has recovered. He survives. <laughs> uh, by 1931, the party returns to Washington, and they had sent, by the end, 4,500 distinct soybean varieties back to the United States, and more than 300 unique soybean products. So examples of what could be done back here um, in the U.S. The arrival of thousands of new plants immediately increased commercial and public interests in soy and soybean products and attracted substantial funding for research and development. So in the midst of the agricultural and economic crisis of the late 1920s and throughout the Great Depression of the 1930s, many scientists hoped to stabilize agriculture by aligning it as closely as possible with scientific industrial processes. So in other words, finding a whole range of modern industrial uses for agricultural products beyond just a source of food. With money from the 1935 Bankhead-Jones Act, which was a Depression-era measure that increased federal money for land-grant universities, researchers opened what became known as the Regional Soybean 
Industrial Products Laboratory at the University of Illinois. The laboratory operated in cooperation with about a dozen state experiment stations and the USDA. So this is a well-funded major research effort. Overwhelmingly, their efforts emphasize developing soybeans, soybean varieties designed for industrial and commercial uses. For a growing number of scientists, farms were increasingly becoming places to produce raw materials, not just finished edible products. So the impact of federal subsidies and chemical research on soybean production was staggering. While in 1934, farmers planted about 6.5 million acres of soybeans, five years later, that number grew to nearly 10 million acres. And by 1944, almost 14 million acres. By the end of World War II, the United States had become the world's leading producer. And in the eyes of many people, soybeans were perhaps the most modern of all crops, adaptable and uniquely suited to the future challenges and opportunities of the post-war world. So some of the work while I've been in residence here at Linda Hall has considered how soy has found its way into countless products that we consume today, including health foods, processed foods, animal feed, um, diverse applications in industrial processes. And I've been wrestling with questions such as, can plants really be technologies? How have various industries shaped the soybean and the landscapes that produce it? And what role has plant introduction played in all of this? I specifically benefited from the library's issues of the Soybean Digest, the Journal of Heredity, very hard to find government publications, and numerous books on soybean production. I've read fascinating reports of using soy for making soaps and linoleum, leather goods, margarine, in oil form as a protective coating for ships and tanks and guns, especially during World War II. Crushed into meal, soybeans have provided a high protein feed for livestock and a versatile flour that could be baked into unlimited forms for human consumption. Today, uh, we mostly see soybeans in addition to livestock feed for humans, soybean oil, Soy protein isolates, in case any of you make protein smoothies, maybe. Um, and soy lecithin, which is an emulsifier and a stabilizer uh, in processed foods. Let me show you a few interesting photos. So this is Henry Ford with his, in some circles, famous soybean car. So the body of this car is made entirely from soy-based products. He was really excited about this, and unfortunately it didn't take off, but this was his dream. <laughs> we would all be driving around in soy cars. <coughs> this is um, a scientist determining the oil content of different soybeans, different varieties. And here are a couple of fun products. So we have soybean infant food and then soybean dog food as well, <laughs> covering the whole range there. I think it's striking that Howard Dorset's expedition brought thousands of new varieties to the United States, but only a fraction of those went into agricultural production. Now, many of the plants shipped from the expedition uh, ended up being discarded due to an inability or an unwillingness to preserve them. Today, about 20 genetically modified varieties amount to 94% of the total soybean acreage in the United States. So 20 varieties out of many thousands. <laughs> I think such a narrow focus uh, stemmed in part from an unwillingness to acknowledge the challenges of agricultural simplification. So by this, I mean that 
the rapid expansion of production while planting only a handful of you know the best varieties brought unexpected problems and undermined the stability in a lot of places of farming landscapes it caused problems it didn't it didn't foresee uh, for many years crop experts believed that soybeans were less affected by diseases and insects than most other cultivated plants they were called the miracle bean because you could do everything with them and pests wouldn't bother them or so they thought uh, but problems emerged as they expanded production acres by 1940 uh, soybean diseases and north american insects had found new ways to attack the crop now over the years soybean monocultures have attracted diverse insect and disease enemies Here's a recent example. In 2009, scientists identified an invasive insect known as the kudzu bug. Although initially it was praised for helping to manage the spread of kudzu, which is an invasive vine that plagues the south, uh, it turns out that the kudzu bug is also really fond of soybeans. Um, and even though seed companies, you know, boast insect-resistant plant lines, no one is bothered to tell the kudzu bug this. And their invasion in some places has led to crop losses of nearly 20%. Um, agricultural simplification, it turns out, is rarely simple. All right, so where does all of this leave us? While observers like David Fairchild believed that plant introduction would expand biological diversity and transform American diets with lots of exotic fruits and vegetables, others thought rather differently. Increasingly, many, often those championing the new science of heredity, saw plant introduction as a tool to generate new economic growth, and stimulate innovation by streamlining and standardizing farm industries. By implementing the science of heredity, they reasoned, you could strengthen America and create a world of our dreams. Now, ultimately, Fairchild's model for plant introduction gave way to narrower approaches. With the rise of genetic science, plant introduction gradually focused on salvaging particular traits uh, in order to breed superior varieties rather than producing whole, supposedly imperfect plants to the landscape. But such aspirations blinded scientists to the consequences of their actions as breeders focused on developing new, high yield, shippable, pest and drought resistant varieties that could be grown in monoculture throughout the United States. This came in many cases at the cost of biotic diversity. Such agricultural innovations, which were heralded as obvious steps forward, at the same time placed real limits on diversity, made landscapes increasingly uniform and at risk in some cases, while narrowing options, choices that farmers could make. Now, where a different choice might have led, of course, remains unclear. But by the 1940s, the path to crop uniformity and large-scale industrial production had been chosen. Although David Fairchild didn't set out everything he didn't ultimately accomplish, everything he set out to achieve, plant exploration played a significant role in shaping both the foods we eat and what's grown in our fields today. Consumers don't have ready access to the hundreds of thousands of exotic plants that Fairchild and his plant explorers brought to the United States. But nevertheless, their impact can be seen all around us, from new fruits and vegetables that we enjoy in the store today, to providing plant breeders with genetic material to create entirely new varieties. Their work has, I believe, profoundly shaped American life. Um, while we might have made different choices about what would stay and what would go, uh, their stories offer us a, a window into attempts to grapple with the emerging science of genetics, the rapidly expanding role of bureaucracies, and, of course, the diverse ecological challenges presented by the plants themselves.
Plant introduction, while undoubtedly shaped by the science and culture and politics of the day, has also indelibly shaped our farms and our markets and the foods that we eat. I hope that today's talk has piqued your interest in plant explorers and their complex histories. Thank you so much. All right, we have time for some questions. We are videotaping and live streaming today's talk, so I want to come by with a microphone. Just raise your hand, and I'll stop by. Uh, one thing, though, before we begin the Q&A, Rebecca has a few books uh, set out on display across the hall in the History of Science Center. So after we finish here, please join her over there to look at those books. Um, now, I'll work my way back going on in the rest of the world with this sort of exploration from the British, French? What sort of communication did these plant explorers have with each yeah. other? Yeah, so it was at research stations abroad. Uh, there was a lot of communication with scientists. So uh, American plant explorers would go to a research station run by a European country in one of their colonies, for example, and they would look at the gardens that they had there, and they would ask questions about, you know, what grows well here? What are the major industries? There was a lot of communication and letter writing between different uh, scientists, especially from Euro European countries. Um, as far as plant science itself, the sort of very utilitarian economic purpose that the United States is focusing on, you don't see that in quite the same way um, in Britain, for example. Um, some of that's going on, but it's a lot more decentralized. It's really the U.S. is kind of leading the way in this moment in that kind of work. I should also mention anyone watching live stream, just type your questions and I'll ask the speaker. So uh, a lot of what you talked about is history, what's happened in the past. Uh, I recently read an article, you know, plant exploration is still going on today. Uh, the article I read was about uh, oh, uh, studying the growth of different varieties of corn in isolated pockets in Mexico, mm -hmm. in Central America. Yeah. So can you talk about efforts today? <laughs> Not very well. <laughs> I will say that one of the challenges um, and long-term effects of plant introduction in the early 20th century is that we developed a handful of varieties that we bred and experimented with and said, these are great, these are the best. And then we re-exported those plants, often to countries where we got the ge genetic material from in the, in the first place. And because there was a market created out of producing and selling that thing, um, a lot of local farmers will cut down um, you know, native forests in order to produce that one thing. Uh, so, for example, there are seemingly unlimited um, diverse varieties of avocados in Central and South America and in Mexico, but farmers, because they know American consumers want to buy Hass avocados, will cut down native forests in order just to produce that one thing. Uh, so it's, it's complicated, and, and I... My limited, my limited knowledge of the present, uh, yeah, I don't want to say too much, but um, there is a real shadow that's cast over the present day as a result of some of the choices that we, we did make um, earlier in the 20th century. Radiated to produce new crops. Did that come out of Fairchild's lab? Is, were there controversies about that? At so that's a great question. Uh, no, Fairchild was not doing that type of work, although I have read about that and uh, learned a little bit about attempts to create new varieties and to speed up the breeding process through exposing seeds to radiation. But that is distinct from what Fairchild was working on. All right, we'll go here and then we'll go to the other side of the room. You spoke about the conflict between Fairchild and his co-workers, regulatory. Uh, 
Had there been any epidemics or, or blights or things that really justified the, the regulatory closing down of things? Yeah, I'm going to give you a politician's answer there, which is yes and no. Um, there were uh, disease and pest outbreaks in the United States uh, every few years. That was a major recurring problem for farmers, although it seemed to be getting worse over the years. Some of those pests and diseases originated in the United States, uh, and some came from other countries. So it's really both going on at the same time. Uh, it's not just the importation of foreign plants that are bringing in these contaminants, um, but that's also a part of the story. So does that, does that help? Okay. Shed some light on David Fairchild's seemingly contradictory interests. He was interested in USDA, obviously, that was collecting a variety of gene genetic material for plants, but he was also involved in the Genetic Association, which seemed to be kind of pursuing monocrop or a, like purity, genetic purity. Um, that those seem to be conflicting. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So he does seem to be taking on two roles that are not always pulling in the same direction, right? The people at the American Genetic Association are really interested in developing from the plant side of things, you know, a handful of these superior crops, superior cultivars that they can replace inferior varieties in the United States with. While at the same time he's running this office at the USDA that's very much interested in bringing back a wide range of plant diversity and seeing those planted in the United States for better or worse. Um, so there's a backstory here and these people are, are often, like the rest of us, it's, it's never one thing that they're doing, right? Um, the reason that David Fairchild uh, becomes president of the American Genetic Association is because of his father-in-law. So he comes back to Washington after some of his travels, and he decides he wants to get married. And he meets Alexander Graham Bell's daughter, after giving a talk in Washington, D.C., as sort of part of this socialite world that he's, you know, trying to ingratiate himself with. And he's invited back to the Bells for their weekly salons that they have with other politicians and scientists, and he becomes a part of that community, a part of that world. And after he gets married to Bell's youngest daughter, Marion, um, Alexander Graham Bell says, I have this other job for you. I need you to become the president of the American Genetic Association because that was an organization that he helped fund. He cared about it. He wanted to see it do well. Um, and so <laughs> he's tasked with doing both of these things at the same time and, and balancing the interests of both. Thank you. Yes. Countries that uh, uh, the presence of explorers. I know that in Brazil there was a lot of uh, resistance to anybody trying to get latex out of Brazil. I don't know whether there were any similar things. Sure, that's a really good question, and it varied from place to place. Um, in some countries. People didn't seem to resist or pay much attention. Um, sometimes they, locals would think that they were spies, so they had to carry uh, government documentation with official seals and all sorts of grandiose things to make it clear, I'm a plant explorer, which is a real thing. It's not made up, I swear. Um, <laughs> and that they were, you know, going about official business. In other places where there were established industries, they, they you know, engaged in what I'm going to call ecological espionage. So they go in and they say, I'm just generally surveying the region to learn about plant life and, you know, asking a few questions and, and trying not to, to get too much attention. Uh, that was especially the case in Turkey with something I didn't talk about today with the Smyrna fig industry. 
So that was, there was a well-established market there in Turkey uh, with Smyrna figs, and it was something that, you know, the entire region was involved and invested in. And so when they send a couple of guys in, they say, don't tell anybody what you're doing. Uh, just keep it really general. And then when somebody back in Washington who wanted some attention publishes an article in the newspaper uh, saying, we've got a guy in Turkey looking at figs, this is going to be great, it gets back to the locals in Turkey. And the poor agent has to tr abandon, you know, where he's staying and travel under a fake name and try to escape, you know, local police who are trying to arrest him and stop him from what he's doing. That's a good question. <laughs> We're at the top of the hour, so we should conclude Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Regley, for a wonderful lecture. <laughs> thank you, guys. And thank you for attending today's program. Please join us across the hall in the History of Science Center in a couple of minutes. Uh, please no food and drink in there, though. Thank you, and... <laughs>